Hi, Gary. <laughs> on time. Between the snow and the flu going around, I'm glad you're all here. And uh, let's pray as we begin our service together. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for bringing everyone here safely and um, just for this opportunity we have to fellowship together as the body of Christ, to worship together, to celebrate the Christmas season and to hear from your word. And I pray, Lord, that, uh, that uh, when we leave here today, we'll be able to say that it's been good and it's been worthwhile to be here together, that uh, something will have been done in our hearts and in our lives that would change us, that something that would last for eternity, something that we could take with us that would impact um, how we celebrate the Christmas season in the weeks to come. Be with those, Lord, who may be sick at home. Be with those who may still be on their way in, in this weather. And I just pray, Lord, that you, your hand will be upon everything we say and do this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please uh, stand as we sing the anthem this morning. The, it's the song you got to sing on Joy Sunday because it is a song that reminds us of the joy that we are acknowledging today, the joy of the season, the joy of Christ. about John the Baptist, who was the guy who came ahead of Jesus saying, look out, he's coming. This passage was spoken by Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus, early on when she had just discovered the role she was going to be playing in the salvation of the world and who this child was that she would be carrying into the world. Let's speak these words together. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in my, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm 
and he has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Yesterday, Paul and I um, were invited by some friends to go to a play. We don't do that very often, but our, our friends had tickets to this play. And, and the play is based on the life of a really famous philosopher. Uh, you may have heard of him. His name is uh, Charlie Brown. And this famous philosopher begins this story sitting with a friend. And Charlie Brown says, I think there must be something wrong with me, Linus. Christmas is coming, but I'm not happy. I don't feel the way I'm supposed to feel. I don't feel the way I'm supposed to feel. Now, I love Charlie Brown. Um, he's, he's got some amazing truths that he has the opportunity to say. But with all due respect <clears throat> to this great philosopher, I think Charlie Brown is getting happiness and joy mixed up. Happiness is an emotion, and joy is a condition. Happiness is what you feel when you get what you want, but joy is what carries you through while you're waiting. Happiness is something that can take you completely by surprise, but joy is something that grows slowly, like the other fruit of the Spirit. Happiness can be a reaction to your circumstances. Joy is based on your identity and knowing whose you are. Happiness comes and goes. Joy endures. This morning, somebody is going to come and light the candle of joy. We're going to light three candles this morning, two white ones and the gold one. So uh, has somebody volunteered for that? I Oh. oh. <laughs> There's a lighter behind the camel. Yep, there you go. So light two white candles and the gold candle, because the gold candle is the joy candle. The joy candle is always a different color because it is, it's got its own story. So uh, while they're lighting the candles, let's pray the words that will be on the screen. God of joy, you have saved us from the oppression of sin and given us freedom of grace and given us peace in our relationship with you and others and given us hope for the beyond. Because of this, we have joy. Joy for what you have done and continue to do. Joy in sharing with others what you have done and continue to do. And we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let's pray a prayer of intercession. This is a prayer that we pray on behalf of other people. People who are not in this room. People who need to know the joy of God. So I invite you to close your eyes and pray along with me as I pray our prayer of intercession for joy. As we joyfully await the glorious coming of the Christ, we pray for the needs of the church, of our community, and of the world. We pray an intercession for joy, joy for the weary, joy for the broken, Joy for the hurting. Joy for the desperate. God of joy and exaltation, you strengthen what is weak. You give hope to those who live in fear. Look on our needs this day. Make us grateful for the good news of salvation. Make us faithful in our service to you and fill us with joy overflowing 
until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives forever and ever. Amen.
So by now, most of you who know me for a while and know that I'm a bit of a sports nerd. I can't play sports to save my life, most sports, but I've always enjoyed watching sports and reading about people who play sports. <clears throat> right now I'm reading a biography of Ted Williams, who was a player for the Boston Red Sox in the 1940s and 50s and considered one of the greatest baseball players of all time. Ever heard of him? That's because you're not a sports nerd. I'm a sports nerd. You heard of him. Yeah. One of the biggest differences I see in professional sports over the years is the amount of money that is paid to professional athletes today. Now, athletes have always made Babe Ruth, who was a famous baseball player in the 1920s and 30s, was once asked by a reporter. He had signed this big contract with the New York Yankees. And a reporter asked him, like, how do you feel making more money than the President of the United States? And Babe Ruth was supposed to have replied, well, I had a better year than he did. And today, I mean, athletes make 100 times more than Joe Biden makes. There's a recent report that Aaron Judge, who's an outfielder for the New York Yankees, and just this past year, he broke the record for, in the American League for the most home runs in a season. So he's a top-notch player. He's just going to, he's going to sign a nine-year contract worth $360 million. That's $40 million a year. That is $27,434.84 an inning. <laughs> he, yeah, not even, no, an inning, not even a game, but like there's nine innings in a game, just like one inning. I know. <laughs> Eve's like, your jaw is dropping. I find it intriguing. You know, at the, at, I don't know if Aaron Judge will do this, but at the press conference after players sign a contract like this, they always invariably use the word happy. They'll, they'll say, you know, I wanted to sign a contract that will make me and my family happy. I wanted to sign a contract I'd be happy with. And they always say it with a very straight face, you know. And I think, well, of course, <laughs> who wouldn't be happy with a contract like that? But the truth is that a few years down the road, the next big player is going to come along, and he's going to sign a contract for an even bigger amount of money. And all of a sudden, the first guy won't be all that happy anymore, and he'll want to renegotiate, and he'll want to get even more. Because happiness is fleeting, yet it is something that many in society are chasing after. I was listening to the radio yesterday, and uh, they were talking about how the holidays can be difficult for some people. And so they had an expert on giving some advice as to how to handle the difficult parts of the holidays. And the expert was described as a psychologist and a happiness expert. I didn't know such a thing existed, but apparently we have experts now even to help us with our happiness because we always look to experts to find the thing we really want, and so many of us want happiness. The American Constitution is one of the most admirable documents ever produced, and in the preamble it gives what are deemed to be the chief goals of their society, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Even 250 years ago, the pursuit of happiness was seen as one of life's ultimate and loftiest goals. Yet in reality, it's more like chasing the wind. Will we ever achieve that elusive goal of happiness? The British journalist, political commentator, and Christian, Malcolm Muggeridge, once said that the American idea of the pursuit of happiness was one of the most ridiculous concepts ever written down in a political document. And I think he's right. It's kind of a shallow goal. And yet it's one that we often buy into because I think we, we fail to see the difference, like Ruth was saying, between happiness and joy. I can't say I remember everything Pastor Darrell taught us. Darrell Peregrine was my youth pastor, and, and I just I admire him so much. And uh, I can't remember, I remember, I can't say I remember everything he ever taught us, but one thing I remember one Friday night, he did a message on the difference between joy and happiness. And it's, import it's an important distinction to look at. They're not the same thing. That first Christmas night, angels appeared to shepherds just outside Bethlehem and told them about what had happened that night in a stable in town. They told the shepherds that a savior had been born and that he was the Messiah, the anointed one. He was Christ the Lord. They told the shepherds where they could find the baby. And they called this proclamation great news that will bring great joy for all the people. Glad tidings of great joy. And on this third Sunday of Advent, the focus of our worship this morning is on joy. 
The announcement of the baby born in a manger touched off a celebration of joy in the heavens. And the angels declared glory to God in the, high, in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Christmas is a time of celebration. Christmas is a time of joy. And yet we know that Christmas can be a time that is anything but joyful for some people. We place really high expectations on Christmas. You know, we think it's got to be perfect and our place has to be decorated just perfect and everything has to fall in place and everybody has to be happy. And when our expectations aren't met, which happens, we can become very discouraged if Christmas doesn't, doesn't turn out just right. And then there are others who have a really difficult Christmas. It might be their first Christmas experienced without a loved one by their side. They may have lost a loved one over the past year. They may live far away from family and may end up being alone at Christmas. And yet, despite the circumstances of our lives, it doesn't change the character of Christmas. It doesn't change the meaning of Christmas. It doesn't change the fact that this season is, is meant to be a celebration of glad tidings of great joy. So maybe what would help us wrap our heads around this seeming paradox, for some of us, is to get a better understanding, a biblical understanding, of what joy means and how that meaning is different from our understanding of happiness. Happiness is something that is completely dependent on our outward circumstances. There needs to be something we experience or something someone says to us or something someone does to us that will make us happy. And happiness can fade once the effect of that outward experience fades away. Being a sports nerd, I'm always very happy when the Montreal Canadiens win a hockey game. So I'm not that happy this morning because they didn't do so well last night. But even if it's an exciting game, and I get to watch it with my friend Stan, who's also a sports nerd, it can still be a very happy time. And it's, you know, the happiness that will last for a while. Sometimes it even feels like joy, but in reality, it's just happiness. Now, happiness is good, but it can't be our ultimate goal. Happiness, because it is dependent on outward circumstances, is fleeting. It's not meant to be our ultimate good. The pursuit of happiness is not meant to be the ultimate goal of being human. But joy, joy is something different. It rests within and it comes from within. Barbara Lee Johnson in her book, Count It All Joy, says that joy has nothing to do with outward circumstances, but rather is a constant and changeless emotion of the heart. Joy is something constant from within that does not change based on the changes of what's going on around us. But there's no denying that, that this life can be difficult sometimes and that it can be easy for the things that we're going through to, as one person put it in the early service, uh, steal our joy, to, to drown out our joy that we feel inside. It can be easy to confuse joy with happiness and let times of unhappiness steal away our joy. So what do we need to do to understand about joy? so that we can hold on to it and experience it, even when things aren't going great around us and circumstances are difficult. Well, first of all, we need to understand that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not something that can be conjured up by our own emotions. It's not something our outward circumstances have any control over. Joy, the pure joy that God offers us, is resident in the Holy Spirit. Joy has its source in God's Holy Spirit. And since the Holy Spirit lives in every Christian believer, then the capacity for joy resides in each and every one of us. It is a gift from God to all who place their faith in him, to all who place their trust in him. And just like love and peace and the other six characteristics that are listed in Galatians 5 as a fruit of the Spirit, joy is also a fruit of the Spirit. And just as an apple is the result of an apple tree, so joy is the result of the Holy Spirit being rooted and grounded deep in our lives. And just like an apple can grow on an apple tree, so the fruit of the Spirit grows in us. And as we allow God's Spirit to work within us, he, he grows character um, traits in us like love and peace and patience. And he grows joy in us. Joy is something that God can grow in our lives. And if we, have, if we have a lot of difficult circumstances around us, it's easy to say, well, I'm not very happy right now. I'm not 
I'm not a happy person right now. But joy is different. It does not find its source from without, but rather from the Holy Spirit within. And as we grow in the Spirit, as we grow in our faith, as we grow in our relationship with Christ, he can grow that fruit of joy in our lives so that it blossoms like an apple tree and can bring forth fruit that can bring nourishment to ourselves and nourishment to others. For true joy is contagious, and it's a blessing to others. But still, like we said, joy is not something we conjure up. An apple does not decide to grow and ripen by sheer force of will. An apple does not think itself into a ripened state. It does not believe itself into a ripened state. It doesn't use karma or positive thoughts. It doesn't even rely solely on the rain or outward circumstances to ripen. There's only one thing that allows an apple or any fruit to ripen to the full extent, and that is to stay connected to the tree. And the fruit of the Spirit grows in us as we stay connected to God by receiving our spiritual nourishment from him, by allowing him to grow in us, grow us into the image and likeness of Christ. So how do we get joy in our lives? By being connected to the giver of joy, by putting all of our faith and trust in God, by welcoming his son Jesus into our lives, by welcoming his Holy Spirit to live within us and to, to develop spiritual fruit in our lives, such as the spiritual fruit of joy. Secondly, joy has its roots in salvation. Psalm 51 talks about the joy of God's salvation. And that goes back to the Christmas story. There was one main purpose for Jesus to be born in a manger 2,000 years ago. And that was so that he could die on a cross 1,967 years ago. In order for us to have salvation. In order for us to be saved from our sins. Thinking of a little baby. You know, just any little baby, holding a baby, looking at a baby, fills your heart with joy. You, you, you can't help but otherwise. And for many, thinking of Jesus as the baby in a manger is as far as it goes in terms of thinking about um, joy of the season for many people. But the deepest joy of Christmas comes when we realize that without Christmas, we would still be dead in our sins. Without Christmas, there'd be no Easter. Without Christmas, there would be no cross. There'd be no forgiveness of sins. We would still be on the hook to pay the penalty for our sins. And scripture tells us that that hook is death. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 10 tells us that if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. By putting our faith in the Christ child, he becomes our savior, and we experience salvation. Our life on earth and our eternal life have both taken on an entirely new direction, and that is cause for joy. We can constantly rejoice that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, constantly rejoice in the salvation we have found in Christ. Thirdly, we find joy in remembering all that God has done for us. Skimming through the Old Testament, if you were to look through the Old Testament and find all the places where the words joy or rejoice are written, so many of them are times when God has just has done something miraculous for his people, or when God has provided for his pe people in a miraculous and special way. And they're praising him and thanking him with great joy. Psalm 28 is one example. It says, Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I will praise him. The psalmist's heart is filled with joy as he considers how the Lord has, has heard his prayer, how the Lord has provided mercy, how the Lord has protected him and given him the strength he needs to to get through a difficult time, how the Lord has helped him and, and proven himself trustworthy in the psalmist's life. If we're finding it hard to find joy in life, I think one thing that will help is to look back. Look back at all the blessings that God has provided in our lives. Remind yourself of those times when your heart just leapt for joy at the goodness of God. 
Remind yourself of those times when he, at that time when he forgave you, and those times subsequent when he forgave you and restored you to himself when you really, really messed up. Remind yourself of how he provided for you when, when you didn't know how you were ever going to sustain yourself or your family. Remind yourself of those times when you never would have made it through without the peace and the strength of your heavenly father. Think of times when he protected you. Maybe even think back to those times when it wasn't obvious then that God was at work, but now you look at, back at it years later and you go, wow, that was you, God. That was you helping me through that time and looking after me. Think back, look back with praise and thanksgiving. Think of where he has brought you from to where you are today. And as you do, let God's joy fill your heart. So looking back on all the good things, that, you know, that kind of makes sense to our human minds when it comes to filling our hearts with joy. But scriptures also talk about other situations that we are to consider pure joy. Situations that humanly may not make a lot of sense to consider them joyful, but we just wouldn't necessarily associate them with joy. The book of Habakkuk is a tiny book near the end of the Old Testament. When I was at my church growing up, we had a boys and girls program called Crusaders. You don't use that term anymore. It has a bad connotation, but it was cru Crusaders. And, and so we had badges, right? I had the sash with the badges. And, and so I wanted to get the Bible reading badge, and so I had to read there was three books I had to read, and one of them was Habakkuk. I think that was the, that was the first one I read, because it was shortest, <laughs> three chapters. So at the end, of chapter, towards the end of the book, at chapter 3, we find this statement that the prophet Habakkuk writes. He says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crops fail and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. So Habakkuk is living in an agrarian society, agricultural society. And what he's describing here is pretty much the worst thing that could happen to a farmer. Absolutely nothing is going right. The crops have failed. The livestock are dead. There's nothing to sell to, to market. No way to, to make a living to look after his family and himself. There isn't even every, anything they can glean off the land to even provide food for themselves. They've reached the end of their rope. What Habakkuk is describing here is devastation and bankruptcy. They have nothing. And yet, says Habakkuk, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Is he crazy? <laughs> is he living in denial? Is he just unwilling to face facts? Is he looking at the world through rose-colored glasses? No. If anything, Habakkuk is living in true reality. He's putting first things first. He's not letting his outward circumstances affect who he really is and who God really is to him. Is Habakkuk happy about the turn of events? <laughs> Probably not. But those events have not stolen his joy. These events have not taken away his trust in a God who can do anything. He remembers how God provided for him in the past, and he rests in joy and faith of what God will do for him in this situation. The very first song I ever sung in church, I was with my guitar. I was 17 years old, and I was too shy to do it by myself, so me and my buddy Alan, we sang... The song that, and the verses to the song were based on this passage from Habakkuk. And the chorus went, Praise the Lord, hallelujah. I don't care what the devil's going to do. The word and faith is my sword and shield. And Jesus is Lord of the way I feel. There are times when we allow our feelings and our emotions to dictate the truth. When we allow our outer circumstances to impact our trust in God. The devil is a liar. The devil's a thief, and he wants nothing more than to use the circumstances that sin and a fallen world bring into our lives to steal our joy and to harm our trust in God. Bad times are going to come to all of us. Are we supposed to be happy about that? I don't think so. That would be living in denial. But in the bad times, in the fire and the flood, 
Jesus promises that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us and that he will walk with us through it all. In the bad times, we know that he's there and that he hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the bad times, we know that our salvation is sure if we don't walk away from it in discouragement. In our bad times, we know that God is still our Savior, that he's still on the throne, and that even though it may not always seem like it, he is still in charge. And that nothing, not famine or any hardship, to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Joy is found when we look back at our past and remember what God has done for us. But joy is also found when we look at our present, even if it's a present that's filled with difficulty and struggle, because we know that we're still in the palm of God's hand and that he has not changed and that his love and his strength will be our source of hope and our source of joy. Joy is found in the past, it's found in the present, but scripture also tells us that joy can be found in the future, even in the midst of difficult times. And by this, I don't just mean the joy of heaven. I mean, that itself is a, an amazing source of joy. But there is something about looking at the big picture of life, even now, considering past, present, and future, that can be a source of joy. James chapter one, two, and four has always been one of my favorite passages of scripture. And it says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When trials and difficulties come into our lives, it's very hard sometimes to see beyond them. It, it just, they, they take up our entire vision an entire scope, and they could be all that we can see. But this verse tells us to consider our trials and difficulties as pure joy. And the way we are to do that is to look at the future, to look at what these trials are going to produce in our lives, to see the spiritual growth that's going to happen, the growth in character that's going to happen that will result from these difficult times. Again, quoting from Barbara Lee Johnson from her book, Count It All Joy, she encourages us to take a posture in prayer that will help us consider trials as joy. She says, when we go through a trial, how many of us get on our knees and say, oh God, teach me in this what you want me to learn. Show me if there is anything in my life that needs to be straightened out so I can understand and know what you are after. Most of us don't pray like that, she says. However, instead, we say, Lord, help me. Get me out of this mess. This is not the way to transform a trial into blessing. Often it's hard to see any redeeming value in a trial or a difficulty in life when we're right smack in the middle of them. And that's why scripture says, scripture says consider it pure joy. It's not a thought that's going to come naturally to us. We have to be considerate. It has to be intentional. We have to, to intentionally see our difficulties the way God sees them. And see the big picture, that they are a place for us to grow in, in character and in our spiritual lives. And the trials we face, the testing of our faith, the passage says, will work perseverance. It will produce a strength that we will need to, to face the next trial and the next trial and the next trial. And to help others face their difficult times. I often think one of the reasons why God allows us to go through difficult times so we can take what he gives us and then give it to others. Our empathy grows so much for other people when we face our own trials. And this passage says when perseverance completes its work, we will see maturity. God uses our trials to build character in us, to teach patience and perseverance, to bring us maturity and give us everything that we need. When we look at the hard times in life that way, we can begin to understand how we consider them to be something in which we can find joy, something that we can actually rejoice about. So joy is different than happiness. It's not dependent on our outward circumstances. It is something that God builds in us as a fruit of the Spirit. And as we stay connected to God, as a, as a fruit stays connected to a tree, Joy will grow in us. Joy will grow in us as we look back and praise God for all his blessings. 
Joy will grow in us as we live in the present, learning to trust God even in hard times, knowing that we are in the palm of his hand. And joy will grow in us as we look to the future, considering the spiritual growth that we will see in our lives as we face trials and difficulties of many times and we walk with them with the Lord's strength. For scripture tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Would you pray with me, please? With our heads bowed and eyes closed just to be focused. Maybe you're here this morning and life has been really tough. Happiness has been hard to find. Joy has been hard to find. Maybe this morning we need, you might need to make the, that effort to consider it joy. So just ask God, Lord, show me that little seed of joy that's, that's still there, that's going to grow into a fruit. Maybe you just need to take a, few, a moment or two and, and kind of recalibrate and let the Lord show you again the joy that he wants to place in your life, that he's already placed in your life. Maybe you're here this morning and, and joy and happiness kind of gets mixed up. You know, and uh, when things happen that make us unhappy, we get really discouraged and we let the enemy steal our joy and maybe we need to just kind of get connected to the tree again, get firmly planted and realize that joy is something different. It's a gift from God, a fruit that he wants to grow in us. And maybe, we'll, maybe we're here and we'll have opportunities this Christmas to share that joy with others as they are more open to Christ through the Christmas season. Wherever you are this morning, take a moment, just you and God. Talk to him. Let him talk to you. Make this message personal in your life. Father, thank you for your plan that we celebrate at Christmas to send Jesus to be our Messiah and our Savior, to bring great news and glad tidings of great joy. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us in times when times that are difficult and times that don't breed a lot of happiness. I pray, Lord, that you would protect us and help us not to let the enemy steal our joy. Help us to know that our joy is rooted in you, is rooted in the salvation that we find in you, is rooted in the blessings that you give to us, in the hope and the future you give to us. Help us, Lord, to be intentional and to consider even the difficult times in our lives, to consider the joy that is to be found in them. Thank you, Lord, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. And help us, Lord, to, to find that strength we need in your joy. And help us, Lord, to share joy with others this Christmas season. May they see something in us that is contagious. May they see something in us that is different from way they, the way they live. May they see something in us that they want. And help us, Lord, to present who you are to them. Thank you, Lord, for the fruit of the spirit of joy. I pray, Lord, that you would grow that in each and every one of us through this season and throughout the year. In Jesus' name.